Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for um, joining us uh, at this hour and welcome to the third colloquium on race equity and social justice for the 2021-22 academic year and the last one of these this semester. I'm Bonnie Thornton Dill, Dean of the College and Professor in the Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies. This series, which launched last year, is part of the college's broader initiative on race, equity, and social justice, developed around the goal of understanding and dismantling structural racism. The broader initiative includes transforming curriculum, reducing discrimination in teaching, research, and service, and expanding the impact of ARHU's longstanding and continuing scholarship on race, racism, anti-racism, equity, and justice. Consistent also with President Pine's focus on racial justice and identity, we're pleased to welcome students who are participating with us as part of the Terrapin Strong onboarding program. In our view, part of our approach um, to Terrapin Strong is to offer opportunities for our students to be exposed to the many different ways faculty in the college study and teach about these issues. Beginning last year, I invited individual faculty experts from across ARHU to discuss their scholarship and creative projects related to anti-racism and social justice. Last year, we focused specifically on anti-Black racism racism, and this year we continue these conversations, expanding the lens to look at the impacts of systemic racism on different social groups, Asian, Jewish, Arab, and Muslim populations in the US, LGBTQ, and Black people. The format for each presentation includes, or each session includes a brief presentation followed by conversation with me and then an opportunity for you to ask questions. So we're asking that you keep your microphones on mute. And during the last 15 minutes or so, you will be invited to submit questions through the chat, which is being moderated by Associate Dean Patrick Warfield, who will manage the question and answer. Um, and also please note uh, that this event is being recorded for future viewing on the college's website. Well, today's session features Dr. Robert Levine, distinguished university professor in the Department of English. Dr. Levine has been an influential force in American and African-American literature for over 30 years, and more recently has contributed important work to the burgeoning field of hemispheric and transnational American literary studies. His prominent publications cover an array of themes critical to the understanding of 19th century American literature. Levine has been awarded many fellowships, many awards, among them an NEH Senior Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a Hubble Medal for Lifetime Achievement in American Literary Studies. His talk today will focus on Black voting rights and his recent book, The Failed Promise, Reconstruction, Frederick Douglass, and the Impeachment of Andrew Johnson. This talk will examine the Black perspective on early years of Reconstruction, on Andrew Johnson, on the 1868 impeachment itself. Most work on the impeachment focuses on radical Republicans like Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stephen. But Levine brings into this discussion the actions and words of Frederick Douglass, Francis Harper, George T. Downing, and other Black activists of the period. These men and women saw Reconstruction as the mechanism through which Blacks might obtain rights to full citizenship including the right to vote. His work highlights the conflicts and failed promises of Reconstruction and Johnson's presidency, many of which resonate deeply with the issues and with debates and struggles we're embroiled in today. So please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Levine. 
Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, thanks for the introduction and, and thanks for having me. I'm going to share my screen. And even though I can be accomplished in some ways, I have an old version of um, PowerPoint that isn't going to work exactly right. Um, but what can you do? And um, let me see. Yeah, so I'm going to talk for something like 10 to 15 minutes, and I have normally been doing 45 minute talks. So just interrupt me if I if I go on too long. I'm just going to talk through some of the slides. And apparently you can see slides to the left, but I'm going to be focusing on the slide at the center. I want to say a word about the title of the book, just to give you a sense of what I am up to in the book. I, I think of the book as about the failed promise of reconstruction. And that was actually the initial title of the book before marketing suggested it even better title. So the idea is that Reconstruction was supposed to be about the development, the growth, the attainment of rights for Black people uh, to citizenship, to voting. Are we still there? I'm not sure. I mean, what I emphasize in the book, because it is a historical book, is how the re Reconstruction failed sometime by the late 1870s or into the 1880s and 1890s. The, the title of the failed promise in an interesting way also speaks to Andrew Johnson. I try to kind of develop a nuanced view of Johnson as someone who had promise and failed to live up to that promise. I was inspired by W.E.B. Du Bois's reading of um, Johnson as in his terms, the most pitiable figure in American history. And he found him pitiable because he thought, yeah, this is maybe someone who could have done a lot better job than he did. Central to the title here is Frederick Douglass. Um, I've read a lot of books about reconstruction. Frederick Douglass gets into some of those books. He tends to have cameos. He tends to be in the background. The emphasis tends to be, as Bonnie said, on the radical Republicans, debates in Congress, et cetera. So I use Douglas to try to bring a black perspective to the center of what I'm doing and trying to understand both the promise, let's say at this point, the promise of reconstruction and then eventually the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. So I'm hoping you can see the slide and if not, I'm just gonna talk through it quickly. Um, this book is a, tr is a trade book. It's published by Norton and trade books emphasize stories. And there is a story and I try to use my skills as an English professor to develop a narrative over the approximate, approximately 300 pages of the book. So instead of just, you know, here's Douglas doing something, there's Douglas doing something. I make an argument that Douglas and Johnson are kind of watching each other for four years, and that there is a story one can tell about, about this relationship. So Douglas and Johnson first meet at Lincoln's second inauguration at a point in which Douglas believes he sees a horrible racist. And I, I explore that particular moment. Johnson becomes president in April 15th and September 29th is Douglas's first explicitly anti-Johnson speech. He refers to Johnson's imbecility and treachery. And Douglas and other African-Americans turned on Johnson more quickly than some of the radical Republicans. And one of the things I was able to trace in the book through the use of the Andrew Johnson papers is that Andrew Johnson is watching Douglas. He's getting reports of Douglas's speeches. And I'll say more about that in a second. A big moment for me in the book is Douglas visit, visits Johnson at the White House with the Black delegation. It's a, it's a wonderful moment because Johnson thinks he's being a great guy having a Black group to the White House and he's just talking to them. And then suddenly Douglas interrupts him and they have a back and forth. And my argument, I'm gonna say a little bit more about this in a second. My argument is that Douglas as a kind of performance artist brings out and exposes the worst in Johnson. Douglas goes on to give this famous anti-Johnson speech, Sources of Danger to the Republic in the summer of 1867. And one of the things that I'm able to, to show in, in, in detail, I think really fascinating detail, is that Johnson is following Douglas as he's giving the speech and 
he then makes a job offer to Douglas. I mean, I find this really shocking, but the idea I think was to shut the guy up. And also I think Johnson wanted to show his credentials as a so-called black Moses. I'll talk about that in a second. And then finally, there's the trial, the impeachment trial. Douglas does not attend, but his son Charles does attend. And there's a whole cache of letters between Charles and his father in the Library of Congress that became a great resource for me as I follow how Charles, Frederick Douglass, and many other Blacks are following the trial and feeling highly disappointed about what the Republicans are up to. In the, in the book, I, I would maintain that there is this large Douglas argument that you see everywhere. And uh, the argument is that slavery is not abolished until the black man has the ballot. Douglas says this on numerous occasions. The specific moment that he says this is, uh, I mean, he says versions of this at any moments. The specific uh, uh, quote is from the May 1865 meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society when William Lloyd Garrison, the head of the, society, of the society, the great white abolitionist says, let's disband. We don't need the society any longer because of the 13th Amendment ending slavery. Douglas says slavery is not abolished until the black man has the ballot. There is a vote at the meeting. Douglas wins. Garrison resigns. And this group disbands in 1870 after the attainment of the, um, of the 15th Amendment. But my, my big emphasis on the book is how Douglas and other uh, African-Americans are attempting to gain voting rights and the rights of full citizenship. Okay, one of my favorite chapters in the book is, I think it's chapter six, when the black delegation visits Andrew Johnson in the White House, February 7th, 1866, the leader is George T. Downing, who is a black activist and the person who ran the congressional cafeteria because he was friends with, with uh, William Sumner, who, uh, with uh, Charles Sumner, who got them the job. The recording secretary is Lewis Henry Douglas, Douglas's oldest son. One of the things I really emphasize in the book is that Douglas is not acting alone. He is always acting with other African Americans as well. And I'm going to have to go quickly here, but what happens at this meeting, and the wonderful thing about the meeting is, is that there's a, there's a stenographer there who gets it all down. So from my perspective as a literary scholar, I can read the, I can do a reading of the meeting. And the transcript ended up in a Washington newspaper the night of the meeting, and it was widely circulated. It was everywhere. Johnson says to the group, he says a lot of things to the group, but he says, I'm going to be your Moses. And in the book, I trace how again and again, Andrew Johnson claims to be a Moses for black people. The meeting is over, people are, are leaving, Douglas is at the door. Douglas says, if the president will allow me, I would like to say one or two words. He would franchise your enemies and disenfranchise your friends. This infuriates Johnson and there's a back and forth that goes on for several minutes, and it ends with Andrew Johnson saying that Blacks should consider immigration. And this gets into the newspaper, and it really disgraces him and embarrasses him. And Douglas in his autobiography says, this is the great moment that exposed who this person was and changed the course of Reconstruction. Um, I have another chapter that, that I like, and it's not as if I don't like all the chapters, but that I especially like, in which I look at a black lecture series that no one has ever written about that took place in Philadelphia. It was led by William Still, the great leader of the Underground Railroad, and Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, great poet, novelist, speaker, and Frederick Douglass Gates' anti-Johnson speeches at this lecture series. And so I look closely at the speeches, and Harper's speech is wonderful because what she argues is racism is everywhere. Uh, it's especially bad in Philadelphia where our, our lecture series is being held. For example, an older black woman was kicked off a trolley car, et cetera, et cetera. So Andrew Johnson is not the only racist in the country. 
But she says, we have needed Andrew John Johnson in this country as a great national mustard plaster to spread himself all over this nation so that he might bring to surface the poison of slavery, which still lingers in the body politic. But when you have done with the mustard plaster, what do you do with it? And I can't keep reading, but he says, rather when you've done with it, you throw it aside. So let's get rid of this president. I, I love the metaphor of the mustard plaster and there's a possibility of healing. Douglas's speech that he gave in this lecture series called Sources of Danger to the Republic. And I just want to emphasize a couple of things about this speech. And I do a long reading of the speech in the book. I also include the speech in the appendix because it just isn't available. It's a speech that Douglas gave to a, you know, a Black audience of about a thousand people. He wants uh, Black men and he wants men, all men and all women, to be able to vote. And the main source of danger to the Republic, he says, is that the Constitution invests the president with too much power. And he says that's especially terrifying when a bad man becomes president. And he attacks what he calls the one man power and then all these different powers of the, of the president. I have a new op-ed in Time Magazine online in which I talk about how this speech speaks to our own moment when bad men are presidents. He refers to Johnson as Massa Johnson, as, as if he's the head of a slave plantation. And in a weird moment in the speech, he suggests that Johnson may have wanted Lincoln dead and may have conspired with the assassins. And he says, therefore, we should get rid of the vice presidency as an institution. All vice presidents want the president dead. So Douglas could be weird at times. Okay, and then I want to say just a few words about the impeachment. The impeachment of Johnson hinged on the Tenure of Office Act, which was passed a year before the actual impeachment trial. And the Tenure of Office Act said that uh, you basically have committed a high misdemeanor if you get rid of, if you fire someone like a cabinet officer who had been appointed by the advice and consent of the Senate, that the Senate would have to agree to this. So what happened was um, Andrew Johnson fired Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War, who was sympathetic with the radical Republicans. And the Republicans formulate 11 articles of impeachment, all of which focus on the Tenure of Office Act. So let's impeach Andrew Johnson, a man who opposed the Freedmen's Bureau, a man who opposed black voting rights, a man who opposed all efforts to reconstruct the South. Let's get rid of Andrew Johnson because he fired a white man. And so this is a big issue that I, that I raise in the book, that the radical Republicans were reluctant to address the issue of race in the impeachment. In part, I argue, because they're pragmatically concerned that white Americans wouldn't really care about that, uh, that they might care more about this particular firing. And they didn't care about that either. Um, so. Um, I, I offer a different perspective on the radical Republicans by raising questions about their unwillingness to actually confront issues of race. Though some, though some did. Charles Drummond D Douglas is uh, the Douglas's third child. He was working for the Freedmen's Bureau. He attends some of the impeachment trial and he writes to Douglas about it. So he becomes a big figure in the book for me. And again and again, he says, this person, Andrew Johnson, should be fired, should be impeached for his racism and for the horrible things that he has done to Black people. Five years after Andrew Johnson's death, Douglas, who regularly wrote about Johnson, uh, wrote that Andrew Johnson, the Moses of the colored race, had betrayed that race into the bloodstained hands of the old master class. He had betrayed the Republican Party by which he had been elected when he was plotting the organization of a new party upon its ruins, when he was seeking the destruction of the Freemans Bureau, when outrage, riot, and murder held sway in the South. And basically what the book does is it traces the history of Reconstruction 
the battles between Johnson and the radical Republicans over the first four years after the Civil War and has us look at all that from the perspective of Douglas, Harper, George T. Downing, uh, John Langston, uh, the Douglas children, people who, uh, Blacks who attended uh, African-American conventions who are disturbed about the fact that the impeachment itself was not about issues connected to race or Black citizenship. And I also address the issue of the 14th and the 15th Amendment. So the Republicans were reluctant to address these issues in the impeachment trial, but they were able to get these amendments approved. Douglas had all sorts of problems with the 14th Amendment. He was excited by the 15th Amendment. And then over the next 25 years of his life, saw the Reconstruction fail. And so the book ends with a sense of that failure. And so I'm gonna stop there. I do a nearly one hour presentation of the book that was done for the National Archives that is online that you can look at. And this is just like my hasty effort to touch on a few things. And I'm, I'm, I am certain that Bonnie is gonna tease out some aspects of the book. I can't hear you. Sorry. I okay, now I can hear you. pushed the wrong button. And okay. so in the spirit of being challenged um, by technology this morning, thank you um, for sharing with us. It is, um, the book is really a tour de force and you've <clears throat> um, encapsulated a lot of things in, um, it, it, very briefly. And so there, there's so much to talk about. And, the, and, and one thing I do want to say to people in the audience who are listening, there are lots of references in what you said to people and events and things that people may not be familiar um, uh, with. And I encourage people to ask uh, in their questions uh, for clarification and for information. You know, one of the things that that was news to me um, as I read the book was, uh, and then I'll ask you a question, but I just wanted to share this with you. You know, I spent 13 years living and teaching in Memphis. Um, I knew all about the yellow fever epidemic. I knew about Ida B. Wells. I went to the uh, before they had established the Civil Rights Museum, all of these kinds of things. I had never heard about the Memphis Massacre in 1866 and uh, how profound that was in terms of the presentation of Johnson as uh, having blood on his hands and really having betrayed uh, Black people. And I think particularly because he was from Tennessee. So uh, there's lots here um, for all of us uh, to, to learn. And I really appreciated that. I, I, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. I, had, I wanted to ask you to start elsewhere with the questions, but I did just want to share that comment. Okay. Uh, I mean, the massacres in, in Memphis and then just uh, a month or so later in New Orleans, were really important uh, developments in, this is in 1866, that leads to black alienation. And, and, and ultimately in 1867 and 1868 to a sense that, um, that Johnson was a murderer because they felt that these massacres were inspired by his, his uh, kind of racist vitriol. So, so that was also a complaint about, about the impeachment trial. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, no, thank you. So um, the vote, that's really central here and it clearly represents citizenship and in their view, protection, safety. So I want, and, and of course today we're talking about the vote. Right. Um, so I wanted you to talk more about what the vote meant in that era, as you understand it, and how the struggle to assure access to the vote today is similar or different. Yeah, so th that's a big question, and it's a great question, and I, I hope you won't mind if I kind of give a roundabout answer. 
Um, but when I wrote the book, I was thinking about the impeachment of Donald Trump. I was thinking that this will give us historical background that might help us to think about how we can get rid of this person. I didn't know that he would, you know, that he wouldn't win a, a second term. Once the book was ready to go, a Norton publicist said, we want you to write op-eds. And we want you to do this because no one knows who you are. You know, they might know you in, in the academy, but they don't know you in the so-called real world. And that got me to think like, what is this book really about? And I, you know, I saw it was about black voting rights. I mean, that's what it was about. And this request from the publicist came just as Georgia, you know, was the first big state to institute rules that would make it more difficult for black people to vote. And so I, um, I think there's a very, so what I got to see, and, and then I also saw this in the, in the kind of pre-publication reviews, all these people, Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, were saying, this is a book about right now, it's about black voting rights. So uh, back in Douglas's time, and we go back to even 1843, which is one of the first black conventions that Douglas attended in Buffalo. And this is, you know, when slavery is still legal. And at that convention, African-Americans are saying, we need the right to vote. And then during the Civil War, Douglas is saying we need the right to vote and that that is a sign of citizenship and it's a sign of humanity because men could vote. So if black men, if black men can't vote, and I suspect you're going to ask me about gender at some point, if black men can't vote, uh, our humanity is being denied as well. Uh, then Douglas and other African Americans during the Civil War and then after the passage of the 13th Amendment are arguing that the vote will enable us to take power and to protect the free people in the South in particular, because we could elect people that, that could develop policies that would help us. So uh, it, it, it almost becomes a kind of broken record in the book, but that is the big uh, issue that Douglas is, is arguing for. And therefore, there's the surprise for me as I was researching this, that he was infuriated by the 14th Amendment. He even wrote an editorial attacking it in the Atlantic magazine because it did not include Black voting rights. You know, that for him was everything. The 15th Amendment is this enormous moment of celebration for Douglas. And then you see him noticing, well, there's a rise of the Ku Klux Klan, which Ulysses S. Grant tr tries to put down. Uh, initially, Blacks are elected to state legislatures, and then uh, it becomes increasingly impossible for Blacks to vote because of violence. And in the 1880s, Douglas is, is uh, furious about the Supreme Court's role in kind of undermining some of the legislation like the Civil Rights Act that would allow black people to vote. And he is uh, basically by the 1890s felt that the work of reconstruction had been undone. So there we have the failed promise of reconstruction. Then we have um, blacks are gaining voting rights in the 1960s, but then suddenly we have this whole idea that Trump was robbed of the election, and there's a focusing on states where Trump would have won if only white people were allowed to vote. And yeah, so the rolling back of black voting rights is something I wrote about for the Washington Post. In Georgia in particular, for me about this whole broad, long history of how difficult it can be for blacks to vote. It's more subtle now. It's more subtle. It's not like you're going to have armed militia keeping blacks from voting in Georgia. But there are other subtle ways that you can cut into black voting rights and make sure that uh, the Republicans get the people to vote that they want to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, also, one of the things that strikes me in the then and now, and thank you, I mean, that, that was very helpful, is the role of violence. Um, Clearly, it's not exactly the same kind of violence. Um, <laughs> right, right. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if 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 um, there's anything more that you want to say about that, but that that. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, a little that I can add, and it's something that I I bring out a bit in the Washington Post op ed, is that the rules that basically empower white people to watch over black voters to make sure that they aren't bringing water to each other. You know, that kind of thing. There's, a, there's this whole uh, kind of surveillance that is written into those laws that to me have a feel of violence. I think that, that there's a website called Voting While Black. I mean, someone referred to me, referred this to me, that there is that sense that you are facing in subtle and not so subtle ways, intimidation you know, intimidation. And you see that in Texas too, um, not just with voting rights, but with the abortion issue, that this empowering of the citizenry to watch over people, it's really scary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the way you work <clears throat> um, as a literary scholar. Um, and and I won't ask the question like what makes you different from a historian, but, <laughs> but I am interested in how the writing of this story is shaped by your work and thinking as a scholar of literature, mm -hmm. and what does particularly your approach bring to an understanding and interpretation of these events? Right. Um, I, I'd say as a, as a literary person, I'm a little I'm. I'm a bit more interested in language. Mm -hmm. uh, that this isn't to say that historians aren't interested in language. I think of historians as, as first and foremost interested in archives and then all these other kinds of things as well. I think of literary uh, historians as first and foremost interested in language, but then going to archives. Uh, and and uh, so I, I wanna say at, at the start that when I began writing this book, the first thing I did was I read through the uh, Andrew Johnson papers. There's 15 volumes published by the University of Tennessee Press. Now, I think a historian would grab into those papers and work with the index. I thought, why don't I read this like Proust? You know, it's like a 15 volume novel. And I'm going to look for light motifs. Um, how he uses language, what language reveals about him. So that's probably a different approach from a historian. And, and so I just read it through chronologically over several weeks and took notes. And those notes became kind of the working foundation of, of the book itself. And so I became fascinated with Johnson's obsession starting in 1864 that he was a Moses for Black people. Uh, some people have told me I, I could have cut some of those references of the book because you see it over and over and over. I also was interested in what I thought was his class insecurity. Uh, and then I was interested in how he turned against a lot of things that he initially seemed to believe in. So, you know, that's one thing that, that I did. And then the other thing as a, as a kind of literary person, but I think this is, you know, historians do the same thing, is... I tried to work with narrative. And um, the previous book where I tried to be sort of a trade writer is a book called The Lives of Frederick Douglass that came out from Harvard, but it was in their trade line. But the chapters are very long and each chapter begins with a deductive statement about what I'm going to do. And the editor I worked with at Norton said, just tell a story, use shorter chapters. And I thought, that I started, you know, I, I was trying to write my own kind of novel, even as I was trying to be analytical. Um, you know, someone like Rick Bell in history is really good at doing that as well. So I don't want to claim that this is just something that we in English can do. I, I think probably the, the, the most Englishy sort of thing that I, I did was the way that I read the Andrew Johnson papers. And I, all along, I've always been reading Douglas from a literary perspective, even as I, I try to think of him in historical context as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I think it's helpful, particularly for students to kind of understand um, 
the ways in which disciplinary <laughs> right, right. Um, training shapes us. In, in fact, speaking of students, you've, of course, and I mentioned earlier, President Pine's onboarding program that challenges new students and faculty to think deeply about identity and especially about their own identities. And many of the people you write about struggled to be recognized, and you've already said this, as fully human, um, while others had identities that shifted due to political pressures. So I was wondering if you might speak a bit about how racially and politically constructed identities operated then and how they might operate today. Well, thanks for that small question. Yeah, I know, no <laughs> small. Well, if you'd written a small book, I would ask right, small right. questions, but you didn't yeah. do that. <laughs> the, there's lots of different ways of answering that. Um, Frederick Douglass, you know, is problematic in the sense that he does marry a white woman late in life. And he said, you know, um, I had a white father and I had a black mother. And so I had a wife first connected to the black mother and then to the white father. So um, he, he sometimes can seem to be post-racial in the way he talks about things. And I think it's a mistake to see him in that way. Uh, I think that there's been an emphasis on Douglas's connection to his white family um, and that we've ignored black, the black Douglas. I, I at times even thought I should write a book called Black Douglas. So for me, racial identity for Douglas has to do with his connection to black community. Um, he had trouble with biological notions of race because at the time they were used to justify black inferiority and he writes about that but what hasn't been traced as powerfully as it could be traced is douglas's something like 40-year history of attending black conventions and being with black people and thinking about politics and identity from that particular point of view, because we tend to think of, Doug, of Douglas, you know, as this more public person who speaks at lyceums, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think that racial identity for, for Douglas was developed through his connection to other black people, which has been ignored in a lot of the black, uh, of the Douglas biographies and historiography. Uh, David Blight is pretty good with that. The previous big biography by William McFeely, it's basically the argument is that Douglas secretly wanted to be white. He was connected to this white family and that's what you get for 400 pages. And I think it's totally wrong. I did earlier write a book on, on Frederick Douglass and Martin Delaney. Martin Delaney, a black nationalist, was much more into a black racial identity, saw connections between black people and Africa. Douglass rejected that. Uh, Douglass talked about Africa sometimes in pretty negative terms as a place of superstition, and we need to establish that our homeland is in the United States. Um, so I, I guess, Working with Douglas, I, I want to. I, I think about race in relation to a sense of black community as as much as anything else. I'm, um, you know, maybe this is a question I should think more about as a white critic who often writes about African Americans. Um, and I am aware that that my history is different. That my uh, kind of situation is, is different, but I, I try to adopt a kind of negative capability and try to get inside of the worldview of the characters that I'm working on and try to do the best possible work I can. I, I will say that my, my interest in African-American studies is new to the University of Maryland. I got my degree at Stanford. I didn't read any African-American writers which might sound strange because I got a degree in 19th century, and my specialty was 19th century American literature. Uh, so in terms of community, this has been a really great and exciting community for me. And basically uh, my first book talks about white male authors. And then I started having conversations with Mary Helen Washington and Carla Peterson. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could actually talk to them in a knowledgeable way 
about African-American writers. And isn't it cool and nice that I could talk to African-American students and to our diverse students about things other than Hawthorne and Melvin, who still really appeal to me. Um, but you know, in terms of issues of community, this has been a great stimulating community for me. Mm -hmm. That's led me to discover things, you know, that I don't think I would have discovered had I been in some other place. Thank you. Thank you for that. Speaking of community, um, both Douglas's community connections to community and your own. Um, I don't know if it was the last session or two sessions ago, uh, Professor Christopher Bonner from the history department um, whose work on Black activists in the early Republic. And kind of, he argues about how they, they um, really formed a conception of American citizenship. Right. And, and, and I'm not, um, and, and your work seeks to foreground Black activists and the struggle for voting rights. And so uh, this whole notion of kind of the strengths of black intellectual scholarship here at Maryland, right. as well as kind of the intellectual work that was taking place among black activists is a theme that seems to run through all of your work. And I mean, both of your works. Right. And I just, I mean, I, it's fascinating. I don't know if you wanna comment on that. I don't really have a question, but it's really a, um, something that's uh, of interest to me in terms of community and scholarship and uh, activists as intellectuals. Yeah, um, I, I attended Chris's talk, so I, I, in a, and I know his book, and there's also a, a, another new book by Derek Spires on black citizenship during this time with the argument that citizenship is about practice, that practice creates citizenship. Uh, Spires' argument is you don't even need the 14th Amendment. Uh, you can practice citizenship and you become part of the nation. I would say that, that what has been interesting me uh, about these issues uh, is the whole issue of black agency. I mean, that's what fascinates me. And so, and, and that I think, you know, has been obscured in some earlier works and specific to my own book, I think the black agency has been obscured in relation to the early years of reconstruction and to the for, to those four years of, um, of Johnson's presidency, that we just don't learn much about that. And I wanna give one quick example that I'm not sure speaks to citizenship, but it, it kind of does. The most widely read, the most popular black newspaper of the period, uh, let's say, 18, the 1860s to the 1880s, <clears throat> is the Christian Recorder. The Christian Recorder me, mm -hmm. was the newspaper at the African Methodist Episcopal Church. It wasn't just a church paper. It was a newspaper of politics. It was a newspaper of arts. Um, anyone here can look at this newspaper. It's on accessible archives. We have that. We have the complete run. If you do a search of Andrew Johnson or impeachments in the Christian Recorder, you will get several hundred hits. Uh, this newspaper, the leaders of this newspaper, all kind of anonymous figures, some of them, were, were uh, constantly following what was happening with Johnson and with the impeachment. They printed, they reprinted the transcript of the black delegations meeting with Andrew Johnson, okay? I work with this extensively in my book. I challenge you to find any book on reconstruction that has any citation to the Christian Recorder. You won't find it. I mean, I've looked, you do not find it. Reconstruction historians for some reason thought that it wasn't important to look at the most important black newspaper of the time to see what blacks were thinking. And in terms of citizenship, I mean, you don't have the 14th Amendment yet, but you have people writing as if they are citizens of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. I, I could go on, but I'm going to stop and let um, the audience in and turn this over 
uh, to Patrick's fascinating conversation. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. This is really, really interesting. Um, you can see there's a question in the chat from Tahari Akbar Williams. Please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that. Why, why aren't we talking about the history of surveillance and violence of black bodies and how it parallels what's happening today? Have we really changed as a culture or are we doing what we've been socialized to do? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you might tie that. You sent us a, a little article you've written for the LA Review of Books on Frederick Douglass and critical race theory. And I wonder if those might be connected in interesting ways. Well, the, is, the, I'm not sure how intimately connected they, they are, but the whole issue of surveillance, I mean, that is a big issue. And I, in, in, in my book, which is focusing more on these larger than white figures like Johnson and, and Douglas, I, I, I show how Andrew Johnson is watching over Frederick Douglass for about four years. A friend of mine, is working on a book on surveillance. And so, yeah, I think this is a really important topic. Um, and surveillance becomes really important, I, I, you could argue, to how things go wrong with reconstruction in, in that uh, there is this uh, almost like police-like surveillance over black people starting into the 1870s, precisely at the point when uh, blacks gained power. The, the, uh, and then that angers and frustrates Southern whites in particular. The op-ed I wrote in the LA Review of Books addresses critical race theory, which I think is a different sort of issue. I'd be happy to talk briefly about that. Um, critical race theory, as all of you know, has been used as a wedge issue for the Republicans to kind of pull white people over to their side because all we're talking about at universities and high schools, et cetera, is about white privilege. And uh, we're trying to make white people feel bad about themselves, et cetera, et cetera. And a um, couple of things that, that I argue in this, in this short piece is that most of us who write about the history of slavery in the United States didn't even know what critical race theory is. I mean, that's one of the points that I think is worth making, that there's a whole lot of different ways of approaching issues of race and the history of slavery than through critical race theory. The other, the other point I, I make is I try to imagine how Frederick Douglass would, would, would respond to, to critical race theory. And I argue that he would find a lot of it appealing because he did believe that uh, inequities were structurally built into the nation on the one hand. On the other hand, strict orthodox critical race theorists raise questions about rights. They say rights are limited. Uh, you gotta change everything. Because if you gain rights, they're still going to be kind of appropriated by or subsumed by the racist structures that do Black people in. And I make an argument that Douglas continued for his, during his career to argue for Black rights and to think that rights were important. And so I'm, I'm not sure that has anything to do with surveillance, but I'm... Um, I would recommend the article to people here. There's no paywall. And um, I, I think that, that Douglas is a really interesting person to think with and against critical race theory. Thank you. And I invite the rest of our audience to feel free to drop questions in the chat or raise your hand. I'm going to ask one more that I'm just curious about you. You started out your comments today with the line, I think this book is about, and I think you said somewhere early on in the book itself about it changing its focus a little bit and writing for a trade press. Could you talk a little bit more about process as you repackage what's usually very serious scholarship for a right. more general audience? Yeah, um, the, the, the things about process, I'll talk about you know what I think I was up to and then how I how the book actually came came into being. So. Uh, as, as I said, and I just would reinforce this, uh, what I thought I was doing was writing a book about impeachment, okay? And I thought I was writing a book about impeachment at a time that we had a president that a lot of us wanted impeached. 
And so I thought that the book would provide some historical background to issues central to the history of impeachment in this country. Okay, so that's what I thought I was doing. And I then, in terms of process, I'm, I was lucky because I'm a Norton editor. I edit the Norton Anthology of American Literature. I have friends there. The person who hired me at Norton to do the anthology, the anthology's editor, is now the president of Norton. I did not have to use an agent. I, I, I did a short proposal for a book and they said, let's give it a try. We will give you virtually no money, but we believe in you. And then they gave me an experienced editor. I work with that editor. So I submitted a five chapter book and it came back with the two months later with the first 10 pages edited. And she said, you're not telling a story. Here's how to tell a story. Um, look at what I do with these 10 pages. And if you want to do it yourself, that would be great. Otherwise, I will try to do this for you. And there was a pandemic. I was sitting at home and I said, I will do it myself. I worked for the next three months to move a book that was five chapters to 12 chapters, to get rid of deductive uh, openings, uh, to try to get people pulled into a story about these two major figures. And I found it a lot of fun and I want to keep writing this kind of book in the future if I do another book. After I finished the book, after I was reading about what was going on in Georgia, after the Norton publicist said, write some op-eds to get your name out there, after I read some free <laughs> publication reviews, I said, oh my God, this is great. I was actually writing about something really vital right now. And I didn't know it because as I was writing the book, there weren't those laws, you know, that, uh, that, that really deliberately are out to suppress the black vote. So uh, the happy news for me is that I didn't need Trump to be elected to a second term for the book to retain its vitality because I discovered that, and I'm being serious here, that, that I really self-consciously was thinking about impeachment and I was thinking about the big story I was telling about Douglas and, and Johnson. Um, I discovered that the book was really about issues that are happening right now and help us to better understand the prehistory of what's happening right now and help us to understand and we're seeing this all over the place right now in, in uh, historical studies, help us to understand that you wanna go back and think about what was a really vital period of American history. It was the reconstruction period. You know, it used to be the abolitionist period of the Civil War. It's the reconstruction period. That's what's the really vital moment. And a lot of us are discovering that fresh, you know, right now. So the process was I wrote a kind of academic book. I got some help in making it into a more readable book for general readers. And I thought I was writing about something else. I think I still was, you know, it still is about the impeachment, but um, I, I could see that there were other really important things that are going on in that book as well. And the last thing I'll, I'll say is that during the period 2018 to 2020, there were about 10 books that were published on impeachment and on the, the Johnson impeachment. I wasn't alone. And one of them, it's called The Impeachers by Brenda Wineapple. It came out in 2019 and it came out while I was working on my book. And it's a big study of the Johnson impeachment. And I thought, oh my God, there's no, no one's gonna need my book. Brenda Wineapple has a 500 page book on the impeachment. Surely she's gonna have Frederick Douglass there. If you check the, the index, he's there. You know, there's like three entries. He's kind of watching things, you know? There's like, he, he has cameos but he's not part of the story. The whole story is the radical Republicans in Congress and they're back and forth with Andrew Johnson. But I think that the more important story for us right now is the story about black citizenship and black voting rights. And it's all there in the book, but it wasn't self-consciously there from the start. 
you were successful in that process. I'll tell you, it was, there were moments at the beginning where I thought maybe Johnson will be redeemable in some way. You set up the, uh, right, the right, story right. really well. Yeah, <laughs> I, and, and, and just to say a word about that, Johnson to me is really interesting and maybe that's my literary training. I see him as a character and here is a person, and, and for those of you who don't, who don't know this, I think he's the only Southern Senator who was anti-secession. He was the only Southern Senator who was anti-slavery, who called for the end of slavery. He put his life on the line. He was shot at. He became military governor under Lincoln. Lincoln liked the guy. 1864, Johnson gives a big speech in Nashville in which he claims to have freed the enslaved people of Tennessee, which he wasn't legally able to do. And that's when he is uh, receives all this adulation from black people in Tennessee, and they they're just telling him, "You are our Moses." So that's where I start with him, and then we just end up where we tend to end up with him that you know he's just so racist and he didn't follow through on any of this. Why I'm not sure exactly what, but I find him fascinating as a character. Are there other questions from our audience? Well, Patrick, I have just one comment. Please. It's interesting to me, the dynamics of a border state and that you find in Tennessee and kind of the mixed um, feelings and expressions for uh, Johnson and then living and working in a border state and how that also kind of shapes one's notion of race. And so um, I just wanted to comment on that yeah. since Bob Tennessee, really- Tennessee, Tennessee maybe precisely isn't a border state, but it was an occupied state. Mm -hmm. uh, and you do have um, some people there who were sympathetic to the union. I mean, the more interesting border state is Maryland. I mean, what a yeah. fascinating, history we have, um, and a lot of that history was brought out in the arguments about the Talbot County Courthouse, which used to have one statue just honoring the Confederate soldiers. And then people wanted to have the Douglas statue. And how long did it take before a Douglas statue was allowed to be there? It was something like 15 years. And the uh, condition was that statue had to be shorter than the statue for the Confederates they had to loom over Douglas. And I think it was just this year or last year that they finally got rid of that uh, Confederate statue. But that's a long history of a border state with very serious divisions. I'll just throw it out as, as the music person. I don't know if you came across Douglas's grandson at all. No, but I'm... Um, so, I, I know someone who's doing a family biography into the 20th century, and I'm sure he's in that biography. Tell me about, so the grandson is the violinist? The violinist who taught at yeah. Harvard. He was a very well-known African-American okay. violinist at the start of the century. Well, I think thanks. thanks. I, I think his early violin is in the Douglas House you know, in Anacostia. Well, we've come to 10 o'clock. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks really for great. having me. Thank you. Thank you. Robin. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you all for joining us. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Bye. We'll see you next semester. <laughs>